We welcome you to a very special next up this evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, when speaking of inequalities, said that health inequalities and health injustice is the most inhumane. Maternal health care experiences are not consistent for all mothers. Across America, including in Missouri and Illinois, maternity, morbidity, and mortality disproportionately affects black mothers and those not on private health insurance. A multi-year report released last August from the Missouri Department of Health and Senior Services found that women on Medicaid are eight times more likely to die within one year of pregnancy than their counterparts with private health insurance. It also found that black women in Missouri were three times more likely to die within a year of pregnancy than white women. Just this week, 9 PBS aired the documentary Birthing Justice, examining the structures and systems that determine the mortality of black women and their babies. Take a look. Nice, strong heart rate. A joyful, exciting, incredible experience. Look at those lips. And that's something that should be available to every family. I lost my first baby listening to this doctor. It's not something that we're doing that's any different from anyone else. Call it what it is, it's racism. Things were kind of spiraling down. Let's shift the narrative. Our moms are worth it. This week is Black Maternal Health Week, and joining us to discuss disparities in maternal health care are Dr. Tyresa Howard, Assistant Professor at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. Welcome, Doctor. Mackenzie Lemieux, third year medical student at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. And joining us from Dallas is Okansola Amadou. She is the first black certified professional midwife in the state of Missouri and the founder and CEO of Jama Birth Village in Ferguson. We welcome all of you to Donnybrook Next Up. Thank you. Okansola, can you please share with our viewers, first <laughs> of all, why the Jama Birth Village has been it has been such a revolutionary place to this point. Yes, um, Jamal Birth Village is a really um, an opportunity for our community to welcome mothers to birth in their full power and to birth in a respectable way. We exist because prior to 2015, um, we did not have any safe community-based places for people to give birth with providers who look like them. There were no black midwives serving the community. Um, there were also only five black doulas that were practicing at that time. And so doulas were widely only accessible to upper uh, middle class white women. And so we really filled in a gap and a void where black women were susceptible to uh, a lot of different medical negligence and issues based on their race uh, in our communities. And so we filled that void by creating black midwives in our community, training over 200 black doulas in our community, uh, to make sure that people are able to receive the care that they need and that they're also respected while receiving that care. So it's imperative when we know in our state that women are harmed at higher rates than um, than white women and that black women are dying at higher rates than black women. It's important that we be our own solution and we provide the care that's needed for us. So we are answering that very important call to save lives and improve birth outcomes. Are you already seeing a reversal in terms of, of, of trends and safety? I am, and I'm so glad that you asked that question. We do have a lot of work to do, but I do wanna applaud our community for catching up. Jamal Birth Village was founded in 2015. And right out of the gate, we were advocating for doulas and midwives and social support services, chiropractic care, massage therapy, different things to support the body through pregnancy that we all need. It's not a luxury. And I'll be honest, the first three years, people thought that I was a bit crazy. They really didn't believe in what I was speaking about. 
And so it took a lot of closed doors, um, you know, for before people started waking up. So around 2018, a lot of people started to get on board with, okay, maybe this midwife doula thing is important. Um, and also I would say that um, hospitals um, and institutions such as WashU and BJC who has collaborated with Jamal Birth Village they really are waking up and encouraging their other staff and team members to be a part of the conversation, to be a solution, to address disparities. So that means us talking about the hard things that racism is the core of this issue um, and finding ways to be the solution. So I am seeing providers um, starting to look at their own biases and racism. Um, I am seeing more providers and hospitals being willing to work with community agencies like Jamal Birth Village. And now the word doula is a household name mm -hmm. in the city of St. Louis because of the work that Jamal Birth Village has done. Where prior, maybe only two or three people out of 10 knew what a doula was. If you ask someone now, I would tell you eight out of 10 people know what a doula is and how to access a doula. So it's tremendous. Well, for the two who are not aware of the difference between a midwife and a doula, Mackenzie, do you want to take that one? Or, or Okinsala, would you like to take that? I don't mind uh, taking that. And then, Mackenzie, if you want to follow up. But um, so I'm a certified professional midwife. Um, and I'm also a Ia Abegbe, which is a traditional midwife in my West African culture. Um, and so a midwife is someone who provides clinical and medical care for low risk pregnant people. So that's someone who maybe does not have any um, at risk or, or risk such as gestational diabetes or other issues that would deem them needing to have an obstetrician or a maternal fetal medicine doctor. Midwives can practice in the hospital, in birthing centers, or they can also uh, provide home birth deliveries, which is my specialty. A doula is a non-clinical, trained and skilled support person who provides educational, informational, physical and emotional comfort and support to the pregnant person and maybe their partner and their family. So the distinct difference is that one provider is a medical provider and the other provider is not medical, but they are essential. And I would just like to wrap that up by saying that doulas are like your GPS navigation system <laughs> oh, if yeah. you're going on a road trip. Right. So you would want to have GPS if you're taking a 13 hour road trip across the country and doulas are very helpful to help people navigate birth. Is there still pushback from the medical profession about doulas? Because th there has been, for sure. And obviously, it's great to hear that a couple of our larger hospital institutions are seeming to work better on with you. Uh, what is the state of play as far as that goes? I think one thing in that realm that we've especially maybe seen during COVID is that a doula is part of the medical team, but sometimes they are considered with the family. And thus, when patients are told, oh, like your, your partner and your mom can stay with you in the room, then the doula is asked to leave. And this is not fair because they're part of the medical team. They should be allowed to stay and support the patient on their 13 hour road trip across the country um, as they are so critical to the patient's well being and their ability to voice their opinions and their thoughts on their medical care and um, that's something that we don't learn in medical school as a medical student um, this is something that i think our education is lacking the the knowledge and understanding of what a doula and midwife do to support birth in for our patients and, and it's so interesting isn't it doctor because mackenzie's saying that this is why mm -hmm. she feels so strongly about a medical career mm -hmm. you have come into this profession with all of of this knowledge mm -hmm. are you encouraged at this moment mm -hmm. because of jama birth village because of this um uh, this this campaign to to raise public awareness are are you more encouraged absolutely and so i moved to st louis in the fall of well the summer of 2019 to join the faculty at washu and i was fortunate enough to receive my own full spectrum doula training by own consola and um November of 2020 and so I think having had that exposure even during COVID 
allowed me to understand what the landscape of maternal health looks like here in St. Louis and as well as what the community is doing to be in, engaged and helping to improve what those outcomes look like because a lot of my work is really centered on a community-based perspective to be able to engage and to learn from the community how to address and to respond what their needs look like. I'm um, an ethical researcher in that I don't think that it's wise and always the best practice to go into communities and strategize around what their solutions might look like. Um, to truly be able to impact change, you have to be connected and engaged with the community so that they're able to inform you about what their needs look like and you respond according to what it is that they are telling you about how to best improve their health outcomes. And so I think based off of my own personal experience, because I actually moved here and I was pregnant as well. <laughs> And so I had a doula who uh, was a part of what my care team looked like and my physician was really open to being able to have the doula to be a part of my care team. And I will say that I had transitioned from care in New Jersey where I had been living previously before coming here and that physician was not, however, as open to having a doula when I was there and having had the conversations about him. And there were certain remarks and things that were made at that point in time that led me to believe that this would not be the most welcoming environment for the sort of birthing plan that I had intentioned. And so I was thankful to be able to deliver with a physician who was open to it because they understood the significance of it. And I think that translates into how we educate students, um, such as medical students, and as well as in my department where I'm educating social workers and public health students and social policy students about how to be able to full spectrum look at the best ways to strategize and come <coughs> together and be informed by the community, by our um, practice experiences in terms of better outcomes altogether. So it's n more than one way to be able to address the issue and it takes, a, I think, a lot of innovation and strategy to really be able to address it in a way that's sustained. I almost hate to ask this, but how might Missouri mm -hmm. rank on this, in this, this area? I, I, are there, I assume there are numbers out there, but mm -hmm. either on the the mortality rate for women mm -hmm. in general or in particular for women of color mm -hmm. it, it how, how do we how are we doing so per my knowledge i think we are about 44 and 45 nationally in terms of where we rank for maternal mortality for all women and i also recognize that i think the most recent data available suggests that um, black women living in missouri are three to four times more likely to um, experience maternal mortality in comparison to white women living in the same state. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's a very hard documentary to watch, mm -hmm. um, but I think everybody who is featured in the documentary is to be applauded because there is no mincing words. It is just flat out racism that these women in their most vulnerable moments are experiencing. Which of you would like to just give our viewers an idea? Uh, they have not had an opportunity to see, and maybe they have many of them, to, to see the documentary, but what a woman confronts when she is, when she's in this position and, and how it does relate to that morbidity rate. Yes, um, I would like to address that. And I would like to say as well, you know, I'm a Texas native. So um, I have lived in Missouri for many years and, and, and commute between Texas and Missouri doing this great work. And I will say that Missouri, um, as most of the most recent report, um, is number uh, seven on that maternal mortality list, ranking all 50 states. And Texas is right behind it at number eight. So um, while that is really horrendous to know, I'm blessed to be able to have the opportunity to work um, across those lines to make sure that people have a voice and options and resources in that way. Um, I will also agree that it's very hard to watch that movie, but it's extremely important. Another thing to remember is that the issues that we're facing with this maternal health crisis is not because there is something inherently wrong with black women. Mm -hmm. It's not because our bodies operate, think, or move different than white women. It is really rooted in the way this nation was created, uh, built on the backs of black people with no respect or no value to our lives. And that has continued post-enslavement. And so we look at a specific law 
um, called the Shepherd Towner Act that was enacted in 1920. And strategically, it was supposed to address the high number of infant mortality um, in specifically the South, but across the nation. But really what it did was it enacted policy to disarm, remove, and also criminalize midwifery and midwives support people, which were doulas at the time. The word doula was not used in the 1920s. We were just there. So midwives and doulas have always been a part of the community since antiquity. Midwives have always been the first line of defense for deliveries and births up until 1920 and moving forward. So this crisis is not by happenstance. Really, when we had over 10,000 midwives in the South specifically up until that law was passed, now Black midwives only make up 2% of the entire midwifery population. So when that defense was removed from the community and Black people were for forced to go into clinics and hospitals where they were practiced upon without their permission and where harms and injustices were done to their bodies because they were defenseless, because their midwives had been removed or criminalized, it allowed that per to perpetuate and to continue. Um, and then we also think about the rise of gynecology during that time where uh, white men strategically were not a part of birthing prior to the early 1900s and late 1800s. So they had to practice to learn. And so they created certain methods that are still used today over 100 years ago, specifically called the D-Leaf method, where these injustices are happening to women when they come into the door. So if you look at those practices that were started in the early 1900s, Couple that with racism, now we have this explosion of maternal health crisis. So um, the movie really talks about the history of how we got here, um, the burden that's on black communities to pull ourselves out of this um, really harmful uh, situation that was put on us. But despite the solutions and the innovations that uh, Dr. Teresa mentioned, that we are carrying those out and we are moving forcefully ahead to make sure that we save ourselves. Now, this is Black Maternal Health Week. It started on April 11th. It ends on April 17th. And it's spearheaded by Black Mamas Matter Alliance. And our theme this year is Our Bodies Belong to Us. And we are celebrating the joy in birth. So that is us taking back our bodily autonomy, being, um, I hate to say the word armed, but being armed with doulas who can just hold space and advocate for us, whether we're birthing in the hospital, home or birthing center, whether we're getting a C-section, attempting a VBAC, um, or whether we are planning to have a vaginal natural birth. So I just wanted to really share that while it's hard to watch, while it's hard to hear these stories, organizations like Jamal Birth Village and many other ones are sharing what we're doing, asking for support, and really hoping to um, influence policy and procedure to give us our rights back and to treat us how we should be treated as high-valued people. Speaking of policy, um, you three are uh, heroically on the first line of defense. What can either a state government or local governments, is there something they can be doing were you the gov were you the governor what would you be uh what would your be your priority list and the next thing you did so i would say in terms of what some of my work and programming looks like i think it's important to look at how we include partners as a part of the birthing team and so being able to understand what it means to have um, paid parental leave to support both partners during that time frame would be really critical at this point in time. And also in terms of um, looking at the first, the fourth trimester, the postpartum period, um, that's a really critical time when we have a lot of issues that perhaps might happen and where birthing people might need additional support. And so if we think about what it means for a person to not be insured and to be only be insured during the state, during the time frame that they deliver, what happens after they deliver and they still need some sort of care and treatment. And so if we expand what the postpartum period looks like beyond six weeks and we expand access to coverage, that would work in terms of having perhaps tremendous benefits to being able to continue to see people who've delivered during um, the first year of a child's life so that we can understand what that birthing person might further need in terms of additional care and treatment. But if they don't have access to the insurance, if they're underinsured, the likelihood for them to continue to engage in care and treatment during that first year 
is um, diminished. And that is when <coughs> most oftentimes you have issues um, in terms of the complications around mortality that might happen within the first year of life. And so those are my thoughts about really tangible ways that we can look at advancing policy to support improved maternal health. I, I think what is what's really striking about the documentary and what I respected so much about it and why it was so impactful watching it is the tone is not conciliatory. The tone is not, please help us. The tone is, you will help us. It is, it is 2023 mm -hmm. and these women and their babies, their lives, and you know, the, 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 in, in, a, in a time when we hear things like pro-life and all of this, it's, mm -hmm. it's thrown around in the political arena. This is the, this is the fastest way to prove that you are in fact pro-life because um, to watch these women who are in 2023 terrified of dying mm -hmm. because no one is listening to them, it's, it's unacceptable. So just that sort of, we're not going to, we, we will not be silenced anymore, that's the message, isn't it, Mackenzie? Well, yeah, we were having a discussion with um, some doulas that are within the community at Wash U, and they were saying that often their, their black patients come to them, and the first thing they say is, I don't want to die. Um, and that's something you never want your patient to come to you saying, and that's terrifying that that's the first thought that happens when you think about birth um, and becoming pregnant, because as um, Okunsola was saying, it should be a celebrated time, it should mm -hmm. be happy. Um, and I think one thing that birthing justice also highlights is, is again, putting the autonomy in the patient's hands yeah. because you do want autonomy of your body and autonomy to decide how your birth plan should look. And, and I think doctors can do a good job of sometimes making it feel like you don't have autonomy and saying, you know, we're gonna do this next and this next and this next. And that's not how I wanna practice OBGYN in the future. I would like to have shared decision making with my patients. Um, but I think wearing a white coat makes it hard for a patient to kind of see that. And that's why I think um, talking about midwives and doulas is so important because those people um, can be at the same level as the patient more easily and, and birthing justice highlights that. And patients often feel comfort with these providers caring for them. Um, so I think those are important, important points to take away from the movie as well. I am certain that mm -hmm. our viewers at 9PBS are some combination of moved and enraged mm -hmm. by what you are discussing. What can the average citizen, the, our viewer, what can our viewers be doing that would be helping your work uh, right away? Yes, and, and I'll start by answering that. And I would say supporting organizations like Jamal Birth Village, we are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, and we are turning eight this year. So we have been doing this work for a very long time before it became a really national um, movement. And so we want people to continue to invest in our work, to sustain our work, so we can continue to be the solution. Um, I will say that uh, in 2020, actually Juneteenth of 2020, we responded um, as revolutionaries at Jamal Birth Village by opening Missouri's first black-led midwifery clinic right in the heart of Ferguson. So I like to consider Ferguson its fertile ground to make that change. And so we had hundreds of people from as far as Australia who donated to Jamal Birth Village to help us purchase the building in 2018 and then renovate the building and furnish uh, the clinic and to get the clinic open in 2020, just a hundred years later after that act was passed to erase people like me and people like our doulas at Jamal Birth Village. And here we are three years later and we're one year into a capital campaign to build Missouri's first black led birth center in postpartum retreat Haven. And this is a $1 million project and it's not just your average birth center, you know, um, the expansion of it as Dr. Teresa, um, Howard mentioned is that postpartum care is important. So if we think about birthing at the hospital and being sent home with little instructions and we know that we're losing lives within 72 hours to one week postpartum, and then we know it's happening more to black women or people on Medicaid, we want our birth center to be a safe haven. So that means after you deliver and give birth, you don't get sent home that same day. You don't get sent home three days later. 
they we have a postpartum retreat haven where we have a birthing hut where they can stay in those amazing retreat spaces for seven days for one week to be cared for nurtured fed and nourished and they can have their friends or family members to come and visit them or their baby so that their friends and family members can also see how we should be caring for and investing in newly postpartum parents. So I will say definitely uh, following Jamabar Village on social media, signing up for a newsletter, choosing to donate consistently or once um, to help us build the birth center and to change birth experiences for St. Louis families. Who would like to talk about the screening this weekend? We have about 30 seconds yeah. left. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Wash U and um, a bunch of other groups, like within Wash U, we've partnered with the group that uh, created the film, Birthing Justice, and it were, and the main host is, is the Jamal Birth Village, and we are just the space as Wash U um, to have this incredible event, screen it on Saturday from 11 till 2, and we're gonna have an incredible discussion afterwards with uh, many different people from uh, leaders at Planned Parenthood to professors from Wash U, including Dr. Howard here, um, and to people who are health uh, professionals for the state and for the city of St. Louis. And I think it'll be an incredible discussion after the film and also some time to reflect on how um, I'm and and we are already and we are oh. linked. Uh, we are linking the event to our website 9pbs.org. If you would like some more information and get involved, they still have openings and they would love to see you and educate you. Okansola Amadou, live from Dallas. Thank you so much, Mackenzie You're Lemieux. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Thank you very much for being here. Thank all of you for watching. 9 PBS, and of course, next up for Ray Hartman and our terrific crew. I'm Wendy Weiss. Have a terrific weekend. We'll see you next Thursday. See how many times I can say terrific. is made possible by the support of the Betsy and Thomas Patterson Foundation and the members of 9PBS.